God invites us on a journey. God leads us through the waters. Each of us comes to life through the waters of the womb. God led us through the waters of the Red Sea for a life of freedom and struggle with the promise of bountiful land. Jesus began his journey of teaching and sharing God's love in the waters of the Jordan River. Jesus commanded his disciples to baptize people in God's holy name so that the message of love and recreation would bless the whole world. In baptism, we are invited to begin and renew a journey that calls us to show God's love in words and actions that uplift community. Be on this journey with God, a journey which God's love manifests in itself in you and through you, in your worship and in your relationship with others. Bring openness and care for all God's children and the entire of creation. We, we celebrate, celebrate and, and share God's, God's love. We, we invite, invite and welcome all to build relationship and nurture community. community. We, we rekindle hope and, and expect God's, God's love to change us. us. The presence of God, the love of Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit is with you all. And, and also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, through the suffering and rejection, you bring forth our salvation. And by the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel, we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh, hi! Hi. I didn't I see you there. <laughs> Welcome to Children's Word. We're so glad you came to join us. We're talking about Psalms this month, right? Yes. So this psalm today, Imani and I were just kind of hanging out and talking, just being, you know, who just we in are. a silly, goofy mood. <laughs> yeah. And we were thinking about this Psalm 116, the beginning of which talks about how thankful we are for how God like is in us all the time and everything we are and everything we do and everything about us is like because of God, and we can give thanks to God for that. That sounds very familiar. Does it now? Yeah, like uh, every step I take, I take in you. Like, I think the song is actually every move I make. Should we do it? Okay. All right, let's do it. So, let's make some space here, because you gotta get ready. <laughs> make room for Jesus. Make room for Jesus. <laughs> Always leave room for Jesus, kids. Okay, here we go. And. Every move I make, I'm making you. You have my move, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Woo Every step I take, I take in you. You are my way, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Woo Waves of mercy, waves of grace. Everywhere I look, I see your face. Your love has captured me. Oh my God, this love, how can it be? La 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 la
You wrote my rules. Jesus, every breath I take, I breathe in you. Woo! Every step I take, I take in you. You are my way, Jesus. Every step I take, I breathe in you. Woo! Waves of mercy, waves of grace. Everywhere I look, I see your face. Your love has captured me. Oh my God, this love. How can it be? Na 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 Yeah! So, that's our psalm for the day. Thanks for joining us. And remember, God made you quirky and he loves you a large amount. Deuces! Goodbye! The Holy Gospel according to Mark, chapter 8. This story provides the turning point in Mark's gospel. Peter is the first human being in the narrative to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah, but he cannot accept that as the Messiah, Jesus will have to suffer. Moreover, Jesus issues a strong challenge to all by connecting discipleship and the cross. Jesus and his disciples went to the villages near the town of Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, what do people say about me? The disciples answered, well, some say you are John the Baptist or maybe Elijah, and others say you are one of the prophets. Then Jesus asked them, but who do you say I am? You are the Messiah, Peter replied. Jesus warned the disciples not to tell anyone about him. Jesus began telling his disciples what would happen to him. He said, the nation's leaders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law of Moses will make the Son of Man suffer terribly. He will be rejected and killed, but three days later he will rise to life. Then Jesus explained clearly what he meant. Peter took Jesus aside and told him to stop talking like that. But when Jesus turned and saw the disciples, he corrected Peter. He said to him, Satan, get away from me. You are thinking like everyone else and not like God. Jesus then told the crowd and the disciples to come closer. And he said, if any of you want to be my followers, you must forget about yourself. You must take up your cross and follow me. If you want to save your life, you will destroy it. But if you give up your life for me and for the good news, you will save it. What will you gain if you own the whole world but destroy yourself? What could you give to get back your soul? Don't be ashamed of me and my message among these unfaithful and sinful people. If you are, the Son of Man will be ashamed of you when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. A gracious God of love, may the words of my heart make known your love and good news of the gospel. Who do you say I am? In the book of Mark, Jesus asked his followers, what do people say about me? The disciples respond to his question. Some say you are John the Baptist, or maybe Elijah. Others say you are one of the prophets. Then Jesus turns the question around on them and asks, but who do you say I am? You are the Messiah, Peter exclaims. Jesus then shares with them his fate. At the hands of the nation's leaders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law of Moses, the Son of Man will suffer terribly. The Son of Man will be rejected. He will be killed. But then three days later, he will rise. He will rise to life. Peter took Jesus aside. Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him. Jesus turned away from Peter, and Jesus caught sight of the disciples. Then he responded to Peter in correction. 
Satan, get away from me. You are thinking like everyone else and not like God. You see, when Jesus had asked the disciples who they thought he was, Peter had been the one to exclaim, you are the Messiah. Yet, when Jesus shared his own fate, his fate of suffering, of being rejected, of being killed and rising to new life, Peter rebuked Jesus. I wonder, I wonder what Peter's definition of the Messiah was. I wonder if the thought of Jesus suffering, of Jesus being rejected, of Jesus being killed and rising to new life was so far from Peter's definition of Messiah that Peter's initial response was to rebuke Jesus. It is easy to judge Peter. It is easy to judge Peter's reaction because many of us know the story. Many of us may have been taught as younger children, may have been taught recently as adults that one of Jesus' disciples will betray him, that at the hands of the nation's leaders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law of Moses, Jesus will be sentenced to death. And that Peter, who called him Messiah, will also deny him. That many of his followers will hide. Yet we remember that it is through Jesus' suffering, rejection, and death, transformational life is born. A resurrected hope, a resurrected grace that covers all people, a resurrected love that encompasses all people. I wonder, who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that Jesus is? What does it mean for us to follow someone we've never met? Someone we've never physically touched? From our previous gospel readings, we know that Peter knew Jesus, was physically close enough to touch Jesus. Peter watched Jesus heal people, feed people, love people. Jesus sat amongst those that were deemed untouchable and filled with sin. Peter watched Jesus stand against imperialistic ways, yet still, even Peter's idea of who Jesus was was far from the truth. Who do we say Jesus is? I know, more, I know for myself, I grew up believing that Jesus was a sandy-haired, blue-eyed, porcelain-skinned white man. I still remember the first time that image of Jesus was shattered. I was in a cafe on the coast of Spain. I had just finished my pilgrimage. There was a wanted sign with the name Jesus, Jesus. There was a description written in Spanish. Now my Spanish at best is second grade level, but I was in shock when I saw the word moreno as an adjective to describe Jesus. Moreno, brown, dark skinned, who? Jesus? I went up to the waiter. I asked them, que esta la palabra? What is that word? as I pointed at the word moreno. Moreno, the waiter said, brown, dark-skinned, like you. Like me? Jesus, dark-skinned? I wanted to rebuke the waiter. Dark-skinned, moreno, like me. I was in shock, taken aback. I had known what the word moreno meant, but to have Jesus described as moreno, dark-skinned, brown, like me. I needed to hear another person say it. I grew up a Christian, attended Sunday worships, Bible studies. I went to a Catholic high school. I've seen countless photos of Jesus. I don't recall ever seeing a brown-skinned Jesus. I remember tears coming to my eyes. I am a brown-skinned woman. I have always followed and loved a Jesus who looked nothing like me. I think of my home, America, 
the Pew Research Center indicates that 70.6% of Americans are Christian, yet racism runs rampant throughout our country, particularly towards those who are of black, brown, and Moreno skin, those who immigrated, whether by choice, force, or lack of choice, black, brown, Moreno-skinned people are more likely to be profiled, profiled and pulled over by police. They are more likely to be met with violence and death by the police. Black, brown, Moreno-skinned people are more likely to be profiled by society. The racist policies snake its way through our culture, through our industries, and through our homes. Jesus is Moreno. Racism shows up through exploitative lending, housing segregation, predatory real estate practices. Research through the Civil Rights and Labor History Consortium states, many Queen Anne residents have this clause in their deed, no person or persons of Asiatic, African, or Negro blood, lineage, or extraction shall be permitted to occupy a portion of said property. In many neighborhoods, the sale or rental of property to black Americans, Asian Americans, and Jewish people were prohibited. These racial deed restrictions were commonly put in place after 1926. Aryans only restrictions were written into deeds as late as 1948. Jesus is Moreno. People who were not affected by these restrictions lived in neighborhoods where housing, continually, where housing continually increased with value. Investments into these neighborhoods were made. Buildings of parks, development of favorable pro programs equated to growth of profitable business and higher paying jobs. Whereas those affected by the restrictions were redlined into certain neighborhoods where value was already depreciating and poverty was concentrated. They called it redlining because on the government-sponsored maps, the neighborhoods were drawn in red to showcase where it was risky to give home loans. In 1968, Congress passed the Housing Rights Act, which outlawed discrimination on the basis of racist on the basis of race or ethnicity in the sale or rental of housing. That was, 53 year, that was 53 years ago, not a very long time. Many of you may be around the age of 53 years. You may be older than 53. You may be younger than 53. Your parents, your grandparents, yourselves may have heavily benefited from these restrictions or opposite. Your parents, your grandparents, yourselves may still feel the devastating loss of these restrictions. The devastating loss of these effects continue to show up in those redlined neighborhoods. The youth that grew up, that grow up in the redlined neighborhoods where it was risky to give out home loans are now labeled at risk. Youth at risk of early teen pregnancy, youth at risk of detrimental substance youth, use, youth at risk of homelessness. We label the youth at risk, placing the blame upon them, labeling them at risk, creating a narrative and conception about who at risk youth are versus youth who did not grow up in neighborhoods where home loans versus youth who did not grow up in neighborhoods where home loans were risky and therefore less likely to be given out. Jesus is Moreno. The whitewashing of Jesus was not by accident. It served a purpose and an agenda. Most of the people who were restricted and redlined into those neighborhoods were black, indigenous, Latin, Asian. They were immigrants. Jewish people. They were not white until they were considered white by American standards. They were black, brown, and moreno skinned. Who do they say I am? Jesus asked the disciples. 
Who do you say I am? Jesus asked. I used to work as a community health educator in Hawaii. One of my favorite parts was leading workshops with youth at different facilities, youth in rehabilitation from substance use disorders, youth that were incarcerated, youth in emergency homes. Many of the youth I worked with were Native Hawaiians. Others came from families who had immigrated from countries the U.S. had claimed as territories but, not given full, but had not given full citizenship to, like Guam and Micronesia. The youth were often black, brown, and moreno-skinned. One of the workshops I led was called Inside Outside. Youth were given a paper plate, then they were asked to write on the outside of the plate a description, a description of how other people saw them. Then they were asked to write on the inside of the plate a description of how they saw themselves. Afterwards, the youth were invited to share. They shared that people saw them as dirty, criminals, homeless, bum, violent, lazy, addict, no good, not worthy. Then I, want, then I invited them to read aloud how they saw themselves. Cool, cook, a mother, a son, a sister, kind, ambitious, painter, swimmer, Christian, friend, a lover, child of God, human. I asked them how these descriptions affected them. One said, Miss, people treat me like a thief. When I walk by, they pat their pockets, they lock the door. I see them. I was just walking by. Another person said, Miss, they don't even see me. And when they do, they quickly look away or avoid walking by me. I asked them, how does the difference between description impact you? They said, what's the point? People expect me to rob them, so what makes a difference? If I do or if I don't? I said, what about me? They said, miss, you're not like them. You ask us questions. You sit down with us. You see us. You eat the chips out of the same bag as us. I wonder, if you were to close your eyes and Jesus asked, who do you say I am, what would you say? Amen. children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Revealing God, you have made yourself known through bread and wine, water and word. 
Continue to nurture your church that is a place where your presence is experienced and shared, whether fully online, in person, or any manifestation in between. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Creating God, you brought life into being and called it good. Bring new creation and rebirth to lands devastated by tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, fires, and other disasters. Especially we pray for all of your creation impacted by fires in the western U.S. and hurricanes in the east. Restore forests and curb overflowing waters. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Protecting God. You desire all people to live in peace and safety. Provide for all who are in danger. Strengthen and grant wisdom to first responders as they work to meet complex needs of others. Provide and care compassion as they themselves face trauma. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Transforming God, you announce release to the captives and freedom to the oppressed. Break chains of discrimination and injustice. Help those bearing the most severe impacts of COVID, climate change, and protect those coping and healing from domestic violence. Amplify voices that go unheard and inspire us to advocate for those who are overlooked. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Forming God, you gather this community together. Shape our communal life that in our prayer, praise, and worship, we honor you and encourage one another. Keep our disagreements civil and increase our joy in working together. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Redeeming God, you accompany your people through every stage of life. We pray for the homebound, those with health concerns, and those facing life transitions. We give you thanks for the saints who rest now rest in your embrace. Give support to those experiencing grief from, from losing someone dear. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our heart known only to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Go forth with your eyes wide open to see the injustices around you. Go forth with feet to stand in the gap for those suffering from our greed. With hands to plant seeds that nourish our bodies, with ears that listen to the voices of the poor and vulnerable, and to the cries of creation. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Hi, I'm Kathy, and I have the announcements for this week. After worship today at 10.30 is Zoom coffee hour. On Monday, September 13th at 10 a.m. is the food bank. Saturday, September 18th at 10 a.m., the building reentry team meeting. And then at 1 o'clock, the memorial service for Mark Hong, father of Hannah, grandfather of Ruby and Sam. Next Sunday, September 19th at 9.30, worship on YouTube. 10.30 to 11.30 is the Zoom coffee hour with communion at 10.45. At 12.45, the C3PK youth group will be meeting on Zoom and also in the ILC parking lot. Have a good week. Go in peace. Serve the living Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you always. And, and also with you. you.
don't forget to like and subscribe down below. And don't forget to tap the bell to get notifications whenever we post. Goodbye. Goodbye.